Hey Guru Nation, welcome back to TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. Again, it's TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. Thank you for watching. If you're new, thank you so much. Welcome. Make sure you subscribe. Go to the blog, subscribe there, follow me on all the social networks. And if you've been watching me for a while, thank you very much. And even if you just watch one minute of one of my videos, it means a lot to me. Keep your questions coming in, uh, comments in the YouTube videos. Uh, whatever you want to do, comments on the blogs. Today I'm going to combine two questions and I keep people anonymous when I answer questions. Uh, so the first one, uh, I watched the interview with Ashley. This person watched the video with Ashley, which you can find on, on underneath this YouTube video. Uh, and it's all about starting up your site. So how did she get funded? It was all bootstrapped. That's number one. However, you can raise money. You can go to the bank. You can use credit cards. I don't recommend that. I recommend, but you can, but I recommend you start out bootstrapping. What bootstrapping means is you do the work to keep the cost down, okay? And rather than hiring someone, you do it whenever possible, all right? Did, uh, so bootstrap, okay? No investors. Uh, she did have a friend, a very good friend who was a doctor, and that was her PI, and she was able to bootstrap that too. Okay, uh, did she get, how did she get the studies and get monitors to come to your site? So, luckily for you, when you get a study, the monitors will come, okay? If you get it, they will come. Uh, the hard part's getting the studies. You don't need to convince monitors to come to your site, right? Uh, once you get a study, the monitors are assigned to your site, they start coming regularly. I think what you're referring to is how do you get someone to come to your site for a site selection visit? And this is where, Ashley, and this is a free plug for my consulting firm, we get studies for people like you, people like Ashley, doctors, anyone who wants to open their own research clinic or even establish clinics. <clears throat> we, we use economies of scale. So you may not want to hire a full-time biz dev person because that's six to $8,000 a month. You hire me for 2000 a month, and we do that. I have an entire team to do this, right? We leverage this. We can scale it, right? this economies of scale. So she uses me to get studies for her. We will help her with feasibility surveys and then the site selection visits will start happening, right? They just do because it's a numbers game. However, you don't need to hire me. You can do this for free. Clinicaltrials.gov. On my website, you can, uh, there's a tab for how to get more studies. I would love for you to be my client, but you don't need me necessarily, all right? But I do uh, shorten those time frames because we already know we're not reinventing the wheel. We know what we're doing. We're not going to learn by trial and error. We're getting you the studies. It, if you do this yourself, number one, it's a lot of work, a lot of time, and you're going to have a long runway because you're going to be learning as you go. Okay, that's the difference. But you can do this on your own. Okay. Uh, she mentioned you have to be a good salesperson. Who are you selling to? Is it the subjects you need for the trials? So, I love this. So, there's three, if you're a research clinic owner, there are three, you have three customers, okay? The patients, of course, you got that right. The once you have a study, then you got to convince patients to join the trial, right? This is recruitment. This is, this is of the, the biggest issue in clinical research is slow enrollment times, okay? So, selling to the patients first, Selling to the PIs, that's your next customer, the principal investigators, physicians, convincing them to join your clinic and do studies for you, and they're going to ask, well, what's a study? And my colleague did a study, it didn't work so well, I don't want to get audited by the FDA, I don't want to lose my license. They're going to have a lot of objections. You're going to have to be really good at learning, educating yourself, learning this business, and then communicating that effectively to physicians, right? And finally, it's the sponsors, the CROs. You gotta convince them to first come to your site to do a site selection visit, and that happens with the feasibility surveys, and even before that, it happens with the phone call pitches that we'll do on your behalf to these pharma companies and CROs, and also the emails we send out. So we do, we've got this down to a science, all right? So that's another, that's your third customer. And then once you get the study, it's keeping the study. Okay, and, and this is a common theme for all three customers, actually. Once you get the study, keep the study. That's an ongoing sales process as well, all right? Uh, a lot of that depends on the quality of your product or your service, all right? 
Uh, but all, a lot of it also depends on your relationships with the CROs. Can you get repeat business from them? Same thing with the physicians. Once you get them to join your trial, how do you keep them? How do you convince them that they should continue doing research when the first six months they might be doing a, a fair amount of work and taking a fair amount of risk? At least risk is what they think they're doing because they're putting their license on the line, which is sort of a myth, but we can we can come across that topic later. Uh, you're going to have to convince them why they should continue doing this. Same thing with the patients. The patient might want to quit the study. They have every right to quit after their third, fourth, fifth visit. Your job is to talk to them and try to convince them to stay in if it really is in their best interest. All right? So hopefully that helps. I had another question that I'm going to get through really quickly. It's because it's on the same theme. All right? So I had my first pre uh, phone site selection visit with a sponsor all right who they asked me three questions I cannot answer who negotiates my contract so you want to say you okay the site owner you negotiate the contracts do I have an EMR which we don't should I get it EMR is electronic medical records it's actually better if you say no and it's actually better if you don't have it because Monitors don't actually like it when sites have EMRs because then there's issues with them getting access to it. Paper records are still preferred in research. I know eventually we are going to transition into EMR only, but it's early for that. Private practices use EMR. Like almost every private practice uses electronic medical records. But research, it's still preferred if you have paper-based records. So that's what you tell them there and no, you don't need it. And then what is the IRB? we're going to be using. So typically you want to say central IRB, okay? Unless you're a hospital or a university, then you're forced to use your local IRB. That's it's called a local IRB. Everyone else, if you're a private research clinic operating independently, you are going to be using a central IRB. You don't need to worry about absolutely anything with finding an IRB because the sponsor will appoint the IRB for you because they chose the IRB that's going to be representing all the sites that can use the central IRB, right? Hopefully this helps. Thank you very much for watching. Dan from theclinicaltrialsguru.com. Thank you, Guru Nation. Take care.